Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to the Sohn Lecture Series. Tonight we'll have a wonderful lecture that um, you'll hear more about in a moment. But before we begin, a couple of housekeeping details. First of all, like all of our lectures and events, this one will end in a Q&A, and we highly encourage your participation in it. So throughout the event, please feel free to enter your questions or comments into the Q&A box. And at the end, our speaker, Tony Vidler, uh, will answer your questions. We'll have about a 15 minute conversation. Secondly, in the chat box, you'll see that we have placed two messages. The first one that I'll draw your attention to is an opportunity to register for the next talk in our series, with Barry Bergdahl. That talk will be on Brazilian modernism and we'll be touching on the theme of color and light um, as we have throughout the, the season in uh, the context of that topic. There's also here uh, an opportunity to click through to our Sohn Museum appeal. Now I've mentioned this appeal before um, in these events and this may be the last time I mention it for this year because our appeal is concluding. It's been enormously successful thanks to you and your generous contributions. And we're simply tonight encouraging those who have not had a chance to give to consider donating so that you're a part of this effort that we've all engaged in to help preserve the Sohn Museum for the future during this rather extraordinary and difficult year. Um, a note, all donations are welcome at any amount and any amount helps from $5 and up. So if it's possible, uh, please consider giving. And with that, I'd like to hand things over to Paul Whalen, our chairman, to introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you, Michael, and a good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, Welcome to our second spring lecture. Here at the Sohn Foundation, we support Sir John Sohn's Museum in London and also sponsor a series of lectures and travel and awards sponsored by Sir John Sohn's work, his career, and his interests. I'd like to thank our trustees and especially our program committee led by Jonathan Hogg for bringing us together here this evening. And of course, also, I'd like to thank Jonathan Diaz Griffith, our executive director who just introduced it myself, me, and the lecture tonight. Uh, tonight, we welcome Tony Vidler, a great scholar of Enlightenment architecture and one of my most memorable graduate school professors from back in the day at Princeton, almost the ancien regime. Tony Vidler received his professional degrees, a degree in architecture from Cambridge University in England, and his doctorate in history and theory from the University of Technology at Delft in the Netherlands. Dean Vidler was a member of the Princeton University School of Architecture faculty from 1965 to 1993. And in 1993, he took up a position as professor and chair of the Department of Art History at UCLA. Dean Vidler was appointed acting dean of the Irwin S. S. Chanin School of Architecture at the Cooper Union in 2001 and dean of the school in 2002, where he served where he served until 2013 as a, his, as a historian and critic of modern and contemporary architecture, specializing in French architecture and the Enlightenment, from the Enlightenment to the present. His many publications include the writings, The Writing of the Walls, Architectural Theory in the Late Enlightenment from 1987, and Claude Nicolas Ledoux, Architecture and Social Reform at the End of the Ancien Regime from 1990, which received the Henry Russell Hitchcock Award from the Society of Architectural Historians. Most importantly, an updated, revised, and expanded version of his 2005 monograph, Claude Nicolas Ledoux, Architecture and Utopia in the Era of the French Revolution, will be published by Burkhauser this March or April. So look out for it. And please welcome Tony Vidler. Welcome, Tony. Good evening. And uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Paul, uh, for inviting me uh, this evening. And thank you for the uh, Sir John Sohn Foundation for this invitation. It's, it's an honor and a personal pleasure uh, since the work of Sohn 
uh, and especially his personal house museum uh, in Lincoln's Inn Fields has held a special place, as I shall tell you, in my career as a historian and as an exhibition designer and curator. Well, if I could actually move. Ah. So I open with one of the most celebrated of the many gorgeous engravings in Ledoux's folio volume of text and engravings. The volume entitled, originally enough for an architectural treatise, Architecture Considered in Relationship to Art, Mores, and Legislation. It was the first of its kind to embrace aesthetics, social ethics, and laws into its title. Here, Ledoux proposed that architecture, as outlined in the plans for Plato's laws, might be instrumental in constructing a just society, as outlined in Plato's Republic, especially if it was guided by an aesthetics that responded to the sensibilities of the individual, or to put it in 18th century terms, Montesquieu's spirit of the laws joined to Diderot's aesthetics and Rousseau's Republic. Here we have a detail of the engraving where we see the poor man sitting under a tree on a block of stone that he obviously can't carve by himself, uh, surrounded by the sea, looking up to the heavens for consolation and aid. And up there, all the gods, all the muses, including Apollo uh, and Zeus and uh, Hera and his, uh, and his daughters uh, and Poseidon uh, and Bacchus are all up there. But right in the center is uh, Mercury and Aphrodite, the spirit of beauty and the spirit of, uh, of, the spirit of uh, communication coming down to aid that poor man as an architect. And for Ledoux, uh, he identified both with Mercury and uh, with Apollo. Next. Oh, sorry. This is what Ledoux thought uh, the architect could do. This is the perspective engraving, very celebrated, uh, where he uh, cites the uh, salt works that he built in Franche Comte, which is the uh, Saline Royale d'Arc et Senon, the salt works, the royal salt works of Arc et Senon, a little village uh, in Franche Comte, uh, quite close to Besançon, where he shows the buildings that he actually built in the semicircle here, extended to embrace a whole town, and then a whole vision of a, a geographic uh, universe uh, taken over uh, with a decentralized city with uh, new founded institutions from the church to the marketplace, the public baths and the stock exchange dotted through the countryside inhabited by a citizenry at one with nature, precisely the object of Ledoux's title. I'll return to this theme, but first, uh, to explain my title, From Ledoux, From Sohn to Ledoux and Back. This is uh, uh, John Somerson uh, uh, in a beautifully uh, relaxed pose and uh, his uh, extraordinarily important and, and faithful, the inspectress uh, of the Sohn Museum, Dorothy Stroud. One of my most vivid memories as a child, I must have been around 14, was being dropped off at the museum by my father, whose office, uh, he was a public trustee, was in Lincoln's Inn Fields, opposite, with the injunction that if, as I declared, I wished to become an architect, I should enter the museum and sketch and learn. Well, I did learn, for it was on one of these visits that the inspectress of the museum, Dorothy Stroud, took pity on me, took me upstairs to her office, sat me at her desk, opened a sketchbook on a stand, and told me sternly that if I wanted to learn how to draw, copy this. What I had to copy was a page of a Reynolds sketchbook and the page was opened at the drawing of a prancing horse. I copied it and still have the resulting sketch in my collection. Every time I've visited London ever since, it's uh, been my pleasure to revisit uh, the museum. Uh, I've taught it several years, uh, starting at Princeton 
uh, and continuously uh, ever since. And that's why it's especially difficult this year not to be able to visit the museum as I've done every time. Here, I took a photograph of uh, the stone uh, bust, but uh, forgot, of course, that I was surrounded by the endless mirrors of surveillance that uh, uh, Sohn uh, installed uh, in his, um, in his uh, house museum. Um, uh, this was actually taken on a trip that I made, the first trip I made uh, via London uh, to France uh, to the salt works of Arche in, uh, uh, I hate to say it, 1967. And that's uh, what I realized at the time uh, uh, Sir John Soane was gazing at. He was gazing at uh, the Apollo uh, Belvedere. Both Sohn and Ledoux were obsessed, I have to say, in their writings with Apollo. The identification was very strong here, Ledoux, at uh, the, uh, uh, the ceiling of the uh, new theater that he built in 1774-1775 uh, in Besançon. Uh, Apollo on his horses, uh, uh, ready to descend uh, and uh, infuse the arts uh, of the theater and the arts of architecture uh, with his beneficent light. And the, uh, uh, the uh, identification, of course, with, uh, with the Apollo Belvedere uh, and Sohn uh, was repeated very many times in his notes uh, and his writings. So what I need to, what I would like to do uh, this this evening is to uh, begin to uh, talk not so much about Sohn himself, although he will continue to figure prominently, but on the interesting connections and the comparisons one can make, architectural and historical, uh, between Sohn and his older contemporary in France, Ledoux. Ledoux's work, rather than that of Stone, of course, has preoccupied me uh, much of my life in research and writing. And uh, here to some of the comparisons. There is Ledoux in uh, around 1774. He's uh, got the uh, plans of uh, the salt works. This is the gatehouse of the salt works he's pointing to with his compasses and his adoring little daughter Ad Adelaide, uh, 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 painted by um, a painter who actually also painted a, a companion uh, piece, uh, uh, which is lost, uh, an oval piece of his wife and other daughter. And here is John Soane again uh, with the uh, uh, sign of the architect, uh, the compasses. Both, and here we start with similarities, both were deeply influenced by the philosophers of the French Enlightenment. Ledoux studied the plates of Diderot's great encyclopedia, and you can see the way in which uh, the plates of the encyclopedia actually do refer to the way in which he laid out his own plates. And Sohn himself uh, was so uh, taken by it that he, he actually has uh, in his collection a complete set of all the folio volumes. Here is the frontispiece uh, to the encyclopedia, uh, by Cochin, uh, showing the muse of, uh, of truth, uh, of the figure of truth, usually veiled in, uh, in medieval uh, uh, iconography, but now uh, transparent to the gaze of all her muses and the muse of architecture somewhere embedded uh, in this uh, an extraordinary collection of muses around the temple of light or the temple of enlightenment. Both Sohn and Ledoux uh, were avid readers of Rousseau. Uh, Ledoux in his text refers to Rousseau over and over again, uh, talks about the state of nature, talks about the social contract, uh, talks about the, uh, the need for uh, mankind to go back to nature. Uh, and Sohn, uh, one finds even uh, in the very first lines of his first lecture, uh, at the uh, Royal Academy uh, in, the, uh, in 1808, uh, refers immediately to Rousseau's discourse. And now we have been uh, 
a, a pair of architects uh, separated by a generation, but deeply involved uh, in the Enlightenment. Both of them were driven by a sense that to renew architecture demanded a return to the essential characteristics of the discipline, a search as it was said for the origins of architecture, even as Rousseau searched for the origins of society. Both were deeply immersed in the history of architecture, which was at the time becoming more and more of an academic and archeological discipline in itself. Both architects were deeply concerned to confront the present with all the authority of the history of their discipline, a history rapidly uh, becoming an archeological uh, 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 archeological discipline. And we have here uh, David Leroy, who uh, the minute that uh, the Ottoman Empire relaxed its uh, prescription on visiting Greece uh, in uh, 1750 and 51, journeyed uh, to Greece, uh, measured and mapped uh, the Acropolis and the uh, religious sites, uh, the temple sites of, of Greece, uh, engraving them and publishing them first in 1758 and again in 1770. Ledoux, who was never to visit Italy and gained, or Greece and gained his instruction in history from books and Gallo-Roman remains in the south of France, immediately used uh, these uh, drawings, the drawings from Le Roy, uh, and there the uh, drawing of the ruins of the Propylia of the Acropolis. Uh, Le Roy's drawings of drawing of the Propylia as he imagined uh, it reconstructed and uh, Ledoux's uh, saltworks entry based, he said, on Le Roy as a propylea, he says, uh, to the monumental saltworks uh, that he built uh, in 1774. Soane, instructed through his grand tour in 1778, will prefer to absorb the more complete historical survey translating Le Roy's introduction for his Royal Academy lectures, taking a lesson of a comprehensive understanding of antiquity in order to employ its orders and ornament appropriately. And there he is pointing to uh, the reconstruction of the temple of Vesta. As Kaufman, Emil Kaufman, the uh, great authority on uh, revolutionary architecture recognized Ledoux's revolutionary, not in the political but formal sense, attitude led him to break with historical convention or use it, and in some cases uh, very much uh, 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 accused by his con contemporaries of abusing it. Soane, in his interest in historical styles, was more, as Kaufman says, a precursor to 19th century historicism. Here we have uh, Pisanga and uh, Gandhi's uh, array of, uh, of the historical objects uh, that uh, from, uh, from antiquity through uh, Oriental, through Gothic uh, to the present that formed Soane's uh, history lessons. Soane was evidently interested in Ledoux's work. He bought the prospectus to Ledoux's uh, great publication in 1803, immediately on its uh, publication. And he bought the first volume of uh, Ledoux's architecture again in 1804, uh, immediately on publication and wrote uh, to his bookseller uh, to immediately get him volume two and volume three uh, as was promised in the prospectus. Uh, but his bookseller wrote back uh, accurately enough saying that volume two and volume three had never been published. So the do actually died uh, two years after the publication of uh, the first volume. Now to similarities. Both architects came from especially modest backgrounds. The do's father was a small village shopkeeper in rural Champagne. Son's father a bricklayer, neither from the high bourgeois or aristocratic lineage uh, promised by for architecture. Both then had the benefit then of an education from newly founded schools of architecture based on the new professional and aesthetic modes of the enlightenment. Ledoux at the public uh, Ecole des Arts uh, founded by Jacques-Francois Blondel, who in fact was the architect writer who contributed to Diderot's encyclopedia. Uh, some 50% of the architectural articles by Blondel 
opening this public school of architecture, uh, which, was, uh, which was founded in 1754, 55, uh, and, uh, and uh, was uh, succeeded in educating most of the major architects of France uh, from the 1860s on through. Uh, Soane uh, was uh, educated, of course, at the Royal Academy School, but the Royal Academy School had been recently revived and refounded on the model of Blondell School, and this through the efforts of uh, Chambers, who himself had studied uh, with Blondell. So both of them had uh, an education, uh, the one handed down uh, from uh, the other, uh, largely constructed around uh, this new professional idea of architecture launched by Blondell and instilled by uh, Chambers. Uh, and of, of course, uh, most of the architects of uh, Soane's generation. Both uh, Soane and Ledoux were especially difficult individuals, proud of their practice and resentful of the impediments of their professional milieu, their reputations as temperamental architects. Arthur Bolton, predecessor to Summerson as curator of the museum, said, Soane was a man of high complex character, prepossessed pre -possessed with the idea of secret enemies striking at him in the dark, a great fighter, but making public his personal misfortunes and grievances. Ledoux, attested by his own writings, was equally paranoid, criticizing his contemporaries for their conventionality, suing his patrons for breach of, breach of contract, and even from prison during the revolution, writing to claim his wrongful dismissal from practice, dying bitter and deserted by colleagues and friends. They were also, uh, it is said, uh, not particularly successful fathers to their children. Uh, this uh, adoring little uh, Adelaide, uh, when her father was put into prison uh, under the revolution and about to be executed, uh, wrote uh, imploringly for his release. On his release, she immediately sued him for her inheritance, fearing, probably rightly, that he would spend all his money on uh, expensive engravings. Uh, and the relationships of Soane uh, with his two sons are very well known and uh, equally uh, contentious. During the 19th century, uh, both architects uh, after their deaths were largely uh, either forgotten or not particularly well appreciated. Ledoux's utopianism was satirized, uh, as we can see here, the famous eye uh, that he uh, gives us as an image of the uh, of the theater the theater of Besançon uh, being re reversed in uh, one engraving and uh, Granville, uh, the great cartoonist of the uh, mid 19th century, actually putting a figure looking back into the eye uh, as a kind of uh, reverse and sardonic uh, uh, comment on uh, Ledoux's vision. Uh, many of the, uh, the ideal projects were satirized. The uh, uh, the uh, highly critical uh, 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 writer of a uh, of a summary of late seventeenth uh, century architecture, late eighteenth century architecture um, in the uh, in the eighteen uh, in the eighteen fifties uh, was very patronizing about uh, Ledoux's idea of a speaking architecture, an architecture that would communicate, an architecture parlante, and said he would no doubt have designed a house for a drunkard in the shape of a wine bottle. Uh, Ledoux was not particularly fortunate after the revolution to have the uh, great toll gates around Paris that he built uh, sacked and, and burned. Uh, the uh, uh, the uh, salt works itself uh, fell into ruination by the end of the 19th century. It's, it ceased op uh, operation from the uh, 1850s on uh, and uh, belonged uh, to a landowner who wanted to uh, demolish it for uh, for a housing uh, for a housing complex and was only stopped uh, just after he dynamited the uh, the central building uh, by a uh, historic preservation order, which was finally slapped onto the uh, onto the salt works uh, and the salt works beginning to be restored in the uh, nineteen late nineteen thirties and picking up uh, between uh, 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 nineteen forty five and 1960. And we know that Soane's great uh, uh, contract and uh, project for the uh, Bank of England, uh, which he was invested in for uh, many, many years, uh, followed a similar fate. 
uh, in the 1920s uh, when it was uh, demolished uh, in favor of a new building. Fortunately, for the period after the war, both Ledoux and Sohn began to fascinate historians and inspiring architects. When I started on Ledoux and the French Enlightenment in general, there was already beginning interest in, in uh, those uh, two architects. The inventive ways in which the designers, always a little and sometimes a lot outside the conventions of their day, joined an enlightenment understanding of abstract geometries and an emerging understanding of history, had provoked historians like Summerson, uh, pointed to the curatorship in 45, after reading his famous lecture to the RIBA on Sohn as a case history of style, publishing his, uh, his book in uh, 1952. Uh, the, uh, he was uh, bursting a, a bubble of uh, quite vituperative work. I remember uh, reading the first uh, major monograph in the 1920s, 1927 by H.J. Uh, Berstingel, uh, when uh, he was uh, responding to the uh, uh, Dulwich Art Gallery, uh, what a thing, he said, what a creature it, said. it is, a morose, a moroso, Gothic, semi-Arabic, moro, Spanish, Anglico, Norman, or what you will production. It has no compere, there's nothing like it above the earth, or under the earth, or about the earth. It has all the merit and emphatic distinction of being unique, say what you please, you cannot say anything so delightfully monstrous as the exterior in question. So this was, uh, this was sown in 1927, uh, and it took till 1952 and, uh, and Somerson uh, to completely reevaluate uh, the architecture of sown. Uh, and it took uh, the uh, uh, work of Emil Kaufmann, who worked uh, in the Ledoux, uh, in, Ledoux in Paris, uh, from uh, the 1920s all the way through to the 1930s, uh, was exiled uh, in the uh, uh, late 1930s, first to London and then to, uh, to New York. Uh, and his little book, Fon le Doux vis le Cabousier, uh, read uh, in German uh, by, uh, by Philip Johnson, uh, becomes uh, someone who uh, uh, picks up uh, le Doux uh, for architecture. Uh, in the uh, United States, there's Philip Johnson uh, reviewing uh, in, uh, in, uh, in 52, 53, uh, the, uh, the glass house uh, developing all his uh, uh, different uh, sources, like some art historian uh, uh, analyzing his glass house. And you can see here, uh, he's uh, talking about the way in which uh, Emil Kaufmann's von der Dubis Le Cabousier uh, inspired uh, the blockness, the blockiness, and the cubicness, and the geometries uh, of his house. But also, uh, you know, also that uh, Sohn was equally inspiring uh, as he uh, designed uh, the uh, complementary house, the the solid uh, and enclosed guest house. Later, uh, we find uh, him uh, even literally inspired uh, by the Du. Uh, building his uh, School of Architecture, uh, inspired by Ledoux's uh, School uh, of Architecture Design uh, from his ideal city. Uh, and uh, even later, in 68, uh, we can find visionary architectures uh, exhibited and the catalogue of visionary architects uh, given a poem uh, by uh, none other than Louis I. Kahn. Uh, and uh, we find a little later even uh, Mark Michael Graves uh, developing uh, a whole uh, set of conventions out of Ledoux uh, in order to uh, develop his own version of an architecture parlante. And uh, other architects, Robert Stern included, uh, were not long in, uh, in picking up on some of the uh, conventions uh, of uh, speaking architecture that, uh, that Ledoux had, uh, had uh, deposited uh, in the 1770s. Uh, Sterling in uh, extending the Tate for a Turner Gallery uh, took particular pleasure uh, in, uh, in remembering the friendship of Turner and Sohn, um, but uh, in, the, in the entryway giving us a, a boulet uh, entry. Uh, actually, I 
I remember discussing with him the uh, the notion of uh, why he used the Boule Temple of Death entry uh, uh, in order to enter this uh, this uh, this uh, temple for uh, uh, for Turner, and he said, "Well, uh, it's not a temple of death uh, because I gave them a revolving door." And uh, of course, uh, Rafael Maneo. Uh, as uh, he reminded us in his stone lecture uh, a couple of years ago, uh, deeply, uh, uh, deeply uh, respecting uh, the uh, the structures and forms uh, of uh, of stone uh, at Dulwich in his Merida uh, entry. So now I return to my discovery of Ledoux. I was a student at Cambridge under Sir Leslie Martin and deeply influenced by the historical imagination of Colin Rowe, seen here, and his ability to abstract from history lessons of composition and formal interpretation on behalf of design. It was Colin in his first supervision who handed me Emil Kaufman's book on the Enlightenment. I was equally taken by the formal inventiveness of my first year uh, studio master, Peter Eisenman, who was busy writing his PhD on the idea of form in modern architecture, both Colin and Peter taught me in studio. And I was also equally influenced by my friendship with the librarian at the time at Cambridge, Francis Haskell, later went on to be the Slade professor at uh, Oxford, uh, equally convinced of the need to situate and contextualize historical figures and their work. So I thus hold our two architects in a kind of double vision. For me, as an architect, as a designer, as someone who loves space. Ledoux and Stone represent an intriguing and exciting historical puzzle in untangling their efforts to overcome their own disciplinary constraints, one in the pre context of pre-revolutionary and revolutionary France, the other in Georgian and early Victorian England, developing its industrial and economic institutions. They are also, in their intellectual and formal experiments, in dealing with history, politics, and society, reveal important aspects, I think, of our own disciplinary formation, for better or for worse, while provoking an extraordinary series of designs that open questions of expression, language, and history in a way that can inform present practice. In other words, I've never been able to give up on either of them. And so, informed through reading Emil Kaufman, Arriving at Princeton to find that the library there had the original copy of volume one of architecture and allowed me to have it in my office for a couple of years studying it. And then driving in 1967 from Basel uh, to Arc et Senon, uh, determined to study uh, this strange factory, uh, a factory that had only been seen uh, by most uh, art historians in engravings, uh, and now uh, almost restored in 1967. I found an extraordinary building, a factory, a monument, but stranded in the middle of a rural valley, a puzzle, a monumental gateway uh, with an arched grotto inside, an equally monumental uh, director's house with a giant order of reticulated columns, and the engravings in Ledoux's book showed an active salt refinery with boiling pans and smoke rising through pyramidal roofs. What I also found in that year was an abandoned industrial artifact in the process of being renovated into a conference center. The ironwork was still on the floor, the bellows were still in the forges, the wooden pipes of the aqueducts were stacked in the warehouses. There was no existing Ledoux archive like many of the 18th century architects. Uh, there's no archive. He actually sent all his drawings uh, uh, because he needed money uh, to Russia. They were bought by the uh, sons of Catherine the Great uh, and uh, have not been found uh, in Russia since. So I had to find out about the salt works. No one in art history or architectural history was particularly interested in the factory version of uh, this particular story. I did, in fact, I found the archive in an archive of the salt works itself, 
uh, abandoned in a uh, in a room in a neighboring uh, uh, neighboring uh, town, Mont Saunier. Uh, I managed to find all the uh, original drawings of the aqueducts. Uh, the original drawings, which showed the layout of the foundations of the semicircular salt works, uh, the original maps that mapped uh, the position of the salt works in the forest that gave the supplied the wood that allowed for the uh, furnaces that allowed for the boiling and then the uh, therefore the evaporation uh, of the of the salt, which has been piped from uh, local uh, local salt springs and all the machinery. Uh, that was necessary. So I began uh, my first work, in fact, was an unpublished book on the uh, salt works itself uh, uh, and the management of uh, the factory. So what follows? I'm going to elaborate on three of the comparisons I mentioned at the outset. The question of the Enlightenment and origins, uh, the question of history and its special relationship to the forms of initiation explored by these early romantics, and finally, their legacy, as they imagined it to constitute itself in a museum that would inspire and educate future architects. As I've mentioned, both architects were deeply impressed with the Enlightenment and its search for fundamental principles. And both read and responded in different ways. That little radical tract by the Jesuit priest, the Abbe Logier, the essay on architecture, 1753, with its frontispiece of the new edition in 1755. Do, of course, read the French edition, and sewn the very different English one. Let's see how they reacted. Here's Logier's essay sur l'architecture, and you see here uh, the muse of architecture. She's sitting uh, somewhat uncomfortably on the ruins of uh, all the architecture of uh, antiquity, and she's pointing to a forest. Uh, she's pointing to a strange temple that seems to have grown up out of the earth naturally, uh, its columns as trees uh, and its uh, architrave and its uh, beams and its uh, roof uh, as, uh, as branches. Uh, and she's uh, showing uh, in the, the, uh, the young architecture student of uh, 1850, uh, 1853, 1855, uh, in the guise of Cupid, you have to love architecture, the natural origins of architecture. For for Ledoux, uh, this, primus, this meant the primacy of, uh, this was a, a metaphor, an allegory, an abstraction. Uh, Loger made it very clear that he was interested in reducing architecture to its geometrical and formal elements, the column, the beam, and the, and the roof. Uh, and for Ledoux, it meant uh, the formal reconstruction of the origins of architecture, not simply as, uh, as, uh, as columns and roofs, but as uh, domiciles for uh, present uh, workers. Here, the forest worker living in a workshop, uh, uh, a woodcutter workshop uh, in the middle of the forest, uh, his rooms pointing down the alleyways of the forest and the workshop uh, all around him, uh, shaded uh, and built out of columns that are built out of logs. The workshop of the coopers uh, or the barrel makers uh, made out of two intersecting uh, cylinders uh, with the rings of the coopers barrels uh, inscribed on the, uh, on the surfaces of them. Uh, and, the, uh, and the habitation of the shepherds no longer, uh, no longer sheltered by uh, their huts, uh, but like uh, the sun uh, that uh, shelters the earth, uh, sheltered in, a, uh, in an image uh, of that which uh, shelters uh, their flocks. Or in more monumental forms, ideal monuments that have cubic forms, uh, this one very much uh, involved in the, uh, as we shall see, uh, in the formation, the uh, double cube of uh, Freemasonry, uh, and uh, this uh, remarkable monument uh, with its uh, Trajan columns, this time not dedicated to war, uh, but dedicated, uh, he says, to tracing the exploits of all the great women who have, uh, have ruled the earth, uh, and he uh, dedicates this monument to uh, uh, as a place in which he himself uh, would like to be buried 
uh, surrounded by uh, the comforting uh, hands of all those uh, women from his mother on uh, that, uh, that uh, nurtured him throughout his life. And uh, when Ledoux does history, he also does it uh, geometrically. And you can see here uh, in one of these late, uh, late engravings of the, uh, of the uh, uh, 1790s and early 1800s, uh, the way in which Egyptology, after Napoleon's expedition to Egypt, uh, had come into vogue. And uh, here, of course, uh, uh, Ledoux's Palladianism mingled with the pylons of uh, Egypt and the pyramids uh, of Egypt. Uh, in order to, to develop double and quadruple houses. Uh, here, uh, even uh, playing with uh, some of the medieval motifs uh, that he had seen in Robert Adams' Scottish castles. So trying to all the time produce uh, history through geometry uh, as opposed to its original uh, form. Sounds. Uh, copy of the essay on architecture uh, was entirely different. Uh, its uh, its uh, language uh, was uh, less flower than the, uh, than the French, very much toned down. Uh, and the frontispiece is entirely different. Here, uh, we have uh, a very um, uh, pragmatic origin uh, of architecture uh, where the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, builders are cutting trees, uh, mixing uh, mortar, uh, felling branches, uh, constructing roofs, uh, and uh, entirely uh, pragmatically constructing uh, a basic uh, shelter. And Stone's history was also different from Ledoux. It was, as Brian Lukacher has de demonstrated with his painstaking research, uh, aided by Joseph Gandhi, a painter architect, failed as an architect, but better known as a renderer of a song. But Gandhi, as uh, Lukacher has pointed out, has uh, actually discovered uh, voluminous manuscripts on history written by Gandhi, uh, was uh, equally historian as he was uh, a painter. And here, Gandhi himself uh, searching for the origins of architecture in nature, uh, a little bit uh, in the uh, middle of the uh, 19th century. But Sun uh, was interested in origins in relationship to the appropriateness of uh, simplicity, geometrical simplicity, uh, and the orders uh, to the tasks at hand. And so we have a whole series of dairies, uh, for example, uh, where uh, the uh, geometry is very simple, uh, the motifs are impressed uh, in the surface, and the dark uh, is uh, as primitive uh, as Sohn uh, can get it. Uh, here in one of uh, Sohn's, uh, one of the uh, plates prepared for Sohn's lectures, uh, the uh, pragmatic and uh, uh, structural uh, origins imagined of uh, temples uh, in wood, as Vitruvius had originally described. And uh, here, uh, Gandhi at work in the, uh, the beginning structures of, uh, of, uh, of Dulwich, uh, the mausoleum at Dulwich. Uh, but uh, uh, despite this, uh, Sohn would always maintain uh, that the architecture was never this kind of uh, undecorated and, uh, and almost uh, brutalist uh, forms that had uh, inspired so much uh, rhetoric about Sohn in the uh, 1950s and 60s. Uh, I remember uh, Peter Smithson uh, showing, this, uh, showing this painting in, in one of his lectures and saying that this was the origin of, uh, of his uh, brutalist style. Um, Sohn always maintained that it had to be finished and decorated uh, before it could become uh, architecture. And if we look at Sohn's uh, image of history, it's uh, entirely different uh, from that of Ledoux. This is where generation uh, is uh, extremely marked. This is where the collector of history, uh, the, uh, the image of the architect uh, bringing all history into his own house as, a, uh, as an educational tool and as a symbol 
of the architect living within his own historical discipline from the from the basement uh, with its uh, Sethus tomb uh, to uh, the uh, months chamber described here uh, in the uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, descriptions of uh, Sir John Soane's museum from the middle of the 19th century and uh, pictured here uh, the monks crypts. Soane himself as indicated by the first description he wrote of his house museum entitled Crude Hints towards a description felt that in some ways he had arrived at the end of history. His vision then was opposed to the exteriority of Ledoux, the futurism of Ledoux, entirely interior. The house over the years became for Soane a kind of tomb of history, inhabited by a disconsolate and alienated, alienated survivor, a monk in his cell. It's very obvious that the, that the monk, uh, this, an archeologist uh, described uh, in crude hints, is a kind of avatar of Soane himself. Uh, and uh, this uh, was uh, one of the paintings that uh, Gandhi, uh, that Gandhi painted of uh, Merlin's tomb based on the myth of Merlin. Which leads me to my next theme, that of the shared response of both architects to the romantic mysticism of the time. History, yes, but also its magic and mysterious depths. History for them is a kind of journey, a route into the past, but also a connection with the past. And its study and narration demanded a kind of initiation. And indeed, it's clear that the Du and Son share a belief uh, that the way to a new architecture, or conversely, the way back to history, demands a certain kind of journey, journey and one that was not easy, one that is at once spatial and symbolic. Both of them uh, take their inspiration from a movement that had reached its height in 1770s France and in uh, 1750s England, inherited from an already formal institutional practice, the lodges of Freemasonry. Ledoux, as far as the rosters of the French Masonic files go, was not like most of his 150 contemporary architects, a member of any of the orthodox lodges of the Grand Lodge. So, as we well know, was interested from early on and was in fact invested in Freemasonry in 1823. Here are the lodges uh, described in various engravings, the, the way in which uh, the initiatory path uh, of initiation from journeyman to, uh, to, to master mason uh, could be retraced as a kind of uh, illumination as a way of, uh, uh, of achieving uh, enlightenment. And the carpets uh, of the Freemasons had all these uh, symbols, as you know, between the double columns, uh, all related to uh, Solomon's temple uh, and the uh, triangle uh, and the double cube, uh, both uh, symbolizing the spaces of the original temple. Uh, and uh, here, uh, 18th century French Masons uh, in, 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 in developing their own uh, uh, ritual uh, formations. And uh, these two, Sone and uh, Ledoux, uh, were connected uh, by a common acquaintance, friend, and in Sone's case, uh, patron, uh, the young William Beckford, uh, who had uh, taken over uh, his father, who was an alderman of the city, uh, his father's estate at Font Hill uh, in Somerset, and uh, built, uh, tore down the, uh, the neoclassical house in order to build that uh, extraordinary Gothic, uh, uh, Gothic uh, towered uh, 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 folly, uh, folly because uh, the tower itself uh, fell down soon after it was uh, constructed. Uh, but also a, uh, an author uh, whose notes, uh, whose, uh, whose authorship of Vathek uh, uh, spread his fame uh, with, uh, throughout uh, the uh, literary world. And here we see him in the uh, 1780s uh, in, his, uh, in his apartment in Lisbon. Uh, and you see that he's drawn his plan of his apartment almost as if it is 
a an initiatory uh, an initiatory uh, uh, set of spaces. And what's interesting there is that uh, Beckford uh, describes a visit to the Do in 1784, uh, where the Do uh, shows him all his projects and buildings, and then takes him. Uh, on a, uh, a long carriage ride through the country, countryside, uh, through a, uh, a high uh, defended wall, uh, through a, an alleyway with uh, wood piles, a little pyramid, a, a barn-like uh, hall, uh, a, an anteroom which looks like a cottage, uh, a room uh, with a white bird sitting in it, a room with a mesmeric uh, chamber and a mesmeric uh, 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 basin, uh, a bas basin like the mesmer's basins of the of the late uh, 18th century, and into a, a chapel lit by a single light. This particular uh, uh, building or set of buildings, which seemed as though it was set up uh, to develop uh, some sense of uh, initiation from the origins of architecture to some form of, uh, of enlightened present was Beckford said uh, uh, designed by Ledoux. If we look at Ledoux's uh, text uh, and uh, see it as Ledoux uh, presents it uh, as an initiatory journey uh, to his own uh, salt works to his own ideal city uh, as he goes down into what he says is the Hades of the old salt works across uh, a rushing stream uh, through fiery uh, paths uh, along watery uh, 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 vapors through and into uh, 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 ho ho hostels that, uh, uh, that purify you and finally uh, reaching the uh, ideal city itself. So these kinds of initiatory journeys in space uh, were part of the uh, architect's uh, repertoire. And I think we can also see uh, that, that, that Sohn, in his descriptions, uh, and I have to say I, have to, I failed in drawing a diagram of uh, Sohn's initiatory uh, paths through uh, the museum uh, in three dimensions. Maybe it could be better done in, uh, in SketchUp or in uh, one of the uh, computer tools of the present. But here, Sohn is actually developing his own initiatory journey uh, through his own house uh, to uh, history. And there, of course, is uh, Gandhi's uh, uh, plate of the, uh, of the Masonic Hall uh, that uh, Sohn started to build in 1826. And thirdly, uh, to the museum. Ledoux had always thought of the uh, collection of plates uh, that he gathered together over his lifetime from the 1780s uh, all the way through to 1804 uh, as a kind of museum of examples that he could uh, leave uh, to future students of architecture. You see, actually, he thought of his architecture as, uh, as called uh, a architectural uh, museum. So I entitled this talk From Sohn to the Do and Back. And so I end the talk, but I'm not in any way ending my preoccupation and passion for Sohn or the Do, with a note on how I returned to Sohn by way of the Do. It was by way of a museum, uh, the museum uh, that uh, uh, the Do had imagined. It was just before the French were to celebrate the 200th anniversary of their revolution, sometime in 1988, that the director of the Ledoux Foundation, Richard Edwards, who had supported my research from the beginning, asked me whether I would be interested in designing and curating a new museum dedicated to Ledoux to be installed in the existing building originally inhabited by the coopers or barrel makers and woodworkers of the salt works. I said, yes, I already had an idea based on the series of collections established towards the end of Ledoux's career, collections of models of historical architecture made to teach the students of the newly revived Academy School and Blondel School. Foremost in my mind, however, was Sohn's model room, at that time not as restored as it is now. So I decided uh, to build a museum of uh, models uh, for the Do. Uh, 
uh, in this uh, uh, pavilion, which was the old Troopers Pavilion, which was completely abandoned. Uh, I assembled um, a team, uh, a Parisian model maker uh, who established a protocol for the models. I engaged a French architectural partner for the technical aspects of the job. And we contracted with local journeys uh, in, in, uh, involved in woodworking uh, in the area. I made a plan uh, which uh, took the central pavilion, uh, which above on the next floor had a circular room, which was a circular common room for the, uh, for the coopers, the uh, barrel makers, uh, I made, a little, uh, made a little stage for the, um, for the viewing of, uh, of, a, uh, of films, about uh, educational films about uh, Ledoux and, uh, and architecture, and then established a, uh, a, uh, a kind of uh, initiatory uh, route uh, from uh, one end up the stairs into a circle to the other end, uh, which started with uh, the salt works, uh, went through all uh, of Ledoux's uh, built works, uh, upstairs, a panorama of uh, all the uh, uh, barrier or toll gates that he had uh, he built in Paris. So that at the center of the room, you looked at the toll gates as if they were surrounding you, downstairs again, and all his ideal projects to a model of the uh, ideal uh, city of show. Um, there is the entry hall with its uh, little stair, uh, the team, which included Pierre Chal, uh, Philippe Poumain, who was an extraordinary model maker, I've never seen uh, models like it, uh, Richard Edwards uh, and myself uh, as the conceiver. Uh, the, everything was built out of local oak uh, with uh, extraordinarily precise joinery. Uh, the models uh, are impeccably made and impeccably uh, maintained. The museum is still in full uh, functioning mode if you go to the salt works. Uh, some are models of sections. This is a section of the director's house. Uh, and you can see the way in which the, the steps uh, evoke the uh, evoke the semicircle of the of the uh, of the whole plan of the uh, of the salt works, uh, which of course Ledoux took uh, from his plan of Vitruvius's uh, plan of the Roman theatre uh, with the director's house uh, uh, where the uh, stage house uh, would be uh, and the uh, workers uh, and uh, and uh, officials around the perimeter as a kind of audience. And with all the ideal projects uh, showing themselves in little light boxes. And I end with Ledoux, as Ledoux ended uh, with uh, plate uh, 100, uh, which he calls the elevation of the cemetery of the city of show. That's the ideal city of the forest of show that expanded around his vision of how the salt works uh, would expand into a whole new uh, city and a whole new uh, civilization. Ledoux takes uh, his, his cue from the latest astronomical observations. Uh, they'd only just uh, discovered uh, uh, the moons and the rings of uh, Saturn and Venus, uh, but he uh, writes a text uh, to this uh, to this uh, strange plate, uh, which is uh, based on his reading of Plato's Timaeus, uh, and at the same time his readings of uh, of the architectures uh, of the articles on chaos uh, and articles on formation of uh, of the uh, of the Earth and the planets. Uh, in the encyclopedia. I leave you with this text. The architect is there, surrounded by vortices and by clouds that challenge his preeminence in the heavens. He sees under his feet shadows that darken the earth and burden it with the morning of the seasons. The forests are stripped bare, the lakes filled with aquatic riches that dried up, the destructive winds vomit epidemics, hunger, and the misfortunes that destroy empires. Unflinching destiny seems to have decreed their end. The earth is isolated 
the fearful man retreats at the side, sight of this dreaded vault that will cover the wreckage of humanity. And it is uh, in that uh, vein that I end reading his text now in the light of our own environmental crisis it takes on a new force as we understand him battling the waters, dealing with floods in Franche-Ponte, guarding against fire, the ever-present danger in the factory, and still hoping that the architect could overcome these perils. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony, for that amazing journey you took us on. Um, uh, there, there are lots of questions that I had thought that I wanted to ask you, but you've answered so many of them, including uh, making the one the great connection between their uh, uh, between uh, for, uh, Freemasonry and their architecture. I've never heard that done as well or as deeply as you did uh, for both of those architects together. I really enjoyed that. And um, I'm wondering, in, uh, Tony, th these are, they were of course of, of exactly, sort of exactly one generation apart. Um, and, but there were such different architects. And I'm wondering if, um, I'm thinking of two differences between them. One difference is that Soane's great inspiration was seeing Roman and Greek ruins in person when he was young. That was what, his great, great inspiration for the rest of his life. And it seems to me like uh, Ledoux's um, great inspiration was more related to books and prints. And I'm wondering if you, you, you agree with that, and if, you, and if so, if how you think that those two primal experiences influence their architecture? Oh, extremely, I think. Uh, Ledoux, uh, when he, uh, he got a little, he was, uh, came from a very poor family, he got a scholarship uh, because he, of his wits, I guess, uh, to a Parisian college when he was quite young, uh, learned an incredible amount of, uh, of just, just basically absorbed antiquity through texts, uh, reading all the Greek texts uh, from Homer to Plato to Hesiod uh, to all the Roman texts. And he quotes them fully and very, very uh, accurately uh, in his texts and uses them metaphorically. But in order to pay his way uh, when he was going to architecture school, he was apprenticed to an engraver. So someone like uh, one of his contemporaries, like Boulet, for example, uh, was a painter. Uh, and you can tell the difference between their architectures, Boulet painting architecture and Ledoux engraving architecture. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, of course, yes, uh, Ledoux never went out of France. Uh, he was, he probably, perhaps, visited England, but nobody can corroborate that, although he does talk about his uh, responses to the, uh, the London Bridge uh, and the way in which uh, horses were treated in England so much better uh, than horses being treated in, uh, in, uh, in France. Uh, he was a great lover of animals. He hated hunting. Uh, he was, uh, he would be absolutely a green uh, today in uh, contemporary, uh, uh, contemporary Europe and America, uh, probably an environmentalist too. But yes, his antiquity uh, was limited to Gallo-Roman remains. And when he went to Aix-en-Provence to uh, design uh, the big prison and the new uh, Palais de Justice, the Palace of Justice in Aix-en-Provence, uh, the foundations of which were started just before the revolution, uh, but we have all the drawings um, and they were never finished, of course. Uh, he took from the Gallo-Roman remains a whole series of, uh, of uh, if you like, geometrical sketches of what they were in order to invest the new uh, Palace of Justice in X with its own history. Uh, so the, there was a relationship there, but always to the what he called the soil of France. He was a very strong uh, nativist, if you like. He was totally convinced uh, from, uh, from his early uh, experiences as a, as a surveyor and engineer in the rural areas of, uh, of France, uh, that there was some really fundamental uh, value uh, to be gained uh, from that kind of, of a nature. Uh, 
he was a friend of the workers he was a friend of the of the woodworkers of the uh, and so on so he he uh, was very much connected like i think in his upbringing in a small village in the in the countryside uh, connected to the country right Whereas Sonia Wright in uh, 1788, he gets his prize from the Academy and uh, he, uh, he goes off on the grand tour and he's able to uh, travel with an assistant who draws and he's able to draw and uh, spends a long time in Rome uh, drawing uh, like all the Renaissance architects that he loved. Uh, the uh, the great uh, monuments, the Pantheon and, and and other monuments of ancient Rome. You're absolutely right. So the, in that sense, it's not just their generation, but it's also their um, their uh, formation as architects that uh, that uh, that uh, you know made the difference. And Tony, I find it very interesting that you talk about Ledoux and his. Um, he seems to be very um, uh, aware of what it means to be French. And and right. uh, sort of what France is all about, and I know that Sone thought very much about uh, his role in the history of England and compared himself to Shakespeare. And uh, I wonder if if you could talk a bit about what you think the differences might be between them that that relate to sort of the natural qualities of France versus the natural qualities of England. It's to me, in a way, they're both kind of archetypal architects. One of England and another one of France. I wonder if you yeah, think You're that. absolutely right. The, uh, the, the Frenchness of, uh, of uh, Ledoux was very, uh, was very split, of course, uh, around the revolution, uh, what, what it meant to be French. Uh, but uh, you have to think of the fact that the whole region of uh, southeastern France, Franche-Comté and the Jura, had until the 1740s, uh, being a province of Spain. Uh, and even today, when you go to Besançon or Franche-Comté and you talk to some of the people in the country, they have an accent which is uh, totally to do uh, with Spanish French and not uh, pure French. They also had a population which was very independent. And uh, in one, you know, in one political way, you can say that uh, the uh, the investment in building new factories in Franche Comté was a kind of uh, a colonial experiment in bringing in bringing Franche Comté into uh, the French uh, hexagon and to uh, defend against the very growing power of Geneva uh, and so uh, Chaux de Fonds is quite close of course to uh, the show uh, where um, uh, uh, Le Corbusier was brought up. Uh, so that there's a there's a sense of a uh, of a, um, uh, of, a of, of, of a both a defensive and an, and and uh, and a kind of uh, accumulative and and defensive uh, quality about uh, about uh, sort of the the monarchy's attempt at this point to reinforce uh, the edges of France. Uh, of course, uh, Vauban had done it for Louis the Fourteenth. Uh, but now uh, Louis the Fifteenth was interested. Uh, Ledoux's uh, friend uh, Charles de Bailly uh, built a new port in the south. Uh, there were new uh, defenses in the uh, on the on the Atlantic coast, and so the, the, there was this sense of of of, of beginning uh, to construct what uh, the you know Louis the Fourteenth had uh, established, which was uh, a, a comprehensive. Uh, monarchic government, yes. Of course, in the revolution, there's Ledoux. I mean, I found uh, the uh, in the prison archives uh, all his interrogator his, his interrogations uh, mm. by the police uh, when he was arrested uh, uh, and uh, very much threatened with uh, execution uh, during the revolution. And uh, and he was always saying, "Look, my architecture is republican. My architecture is republican." Uh, can't you let me out uh, so that I can go and get my crayons and, and do more architecture for you? I'll give you, I'll give you architecture if you release me. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, it's an amazing uh, set of documents uh, where he's uh, writing to all his friends to 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 help him uh, with materials. He's writing his big text there too, um, so he never gives up. But he always believes that in one way or another he was uh, even though he was 
probably one of the most powerful servants of uh, not only the monarchy, but the monarchy's mistresses and, uh, and the monarchy's, uh, you know, the monarchy's most powerful financial agency, the tax farm who built the salt works and built the toll gates. Uh, that's interesting to me that uh, he got his major commissions throughout his life from the tax farm, which was the major economic institution in France, and Sohn, the Bank of England. That these, uh, these nascent institutions of, uh, of mercantile capitalism in relationship to France and industrial capitalism in relationship to England are always the big spur uh, to uh, original uh, architecture. Mm. That's wonderful. Uh, I, I, frankly, I'd like to hog you for another hour, but I shouldn't. So, Michael, I'm wondering if you could, uh, can, are there some questions from the audience you'd like to bring up? There are. And, and first, I'd like to say, Tony, we have received dozens and actually maybe two dozen expressions of gratitude for your lecture from the audience. Oh. So I want to give voice to that and say that there is just a, an enormous amount of gratitude for the treat that you just bestowed on us. And <laughs> I'm scrolling through thanks right now. But the, the last, your last uh, comment leads to a question raised by Sean, who asks, do you think that either architect's idealism was inspired by what we might think of as socialist or populist principles, or just a desire to help the people? Or was it purely idealist and, and sort of focused on um, an abstract depiction of, of history through these ideal forms? So she, she wants to sort of ask you to situate the politics Okay, in, your own, in, in I, your own thinking. And that's where they very much differ. Um, I think Ledoux had, um, uh, through his friendships with uh, philosophers and writers, uh, he was very close to uh, some of the major poets of, uh, of his day. He even designed a house for the Abbe de Lille, who was one of the great uh, romantic, uh, pre-romantic poets of, uh, of France. Um, he was deeply uh, convinced uh, also uh, by the, uh, the uh, new economic theories uh, of, uh, of what, uh, what's called the physiocrats, uh, Duquesnay and others who were developing uh, theories of uh, economics which were not mercantile capitalists, but were to do with bringing out of the earth riches for humanity and returning those riches to the earth and were totally involved in the renovation of agriculture and of course, salt uh, comes out of the earth as water is made into salt, uh, produces riches, which then in the do and the physicrats terms. And of course, that's a circle. And he made that all the time, the, rela the relationship between the economic circle and the social circle and the circle that uh, Rousseau uh, uh, gives you as a kind of ideal uh, village of all the people sitting around hand in hand singing songs. So there's a social economic idealism there, uh, which uh, like most of the enlightenment uh, does not uh, necessarily, uh, is not necessarily absolutely Republican, is not necessarily anti-monarchic. It's for a beneficent monarchy as opposed to a, right? So it's an easy translatable into uh, the, the physiocracy to the philosophy of nature to Rousseau to Republicanism. And so that's how, that's how it's moved right, um, away from uh, the monarchy to a republic, but with a very similar ethic in relationship uh, to le peuple, and uh, Ledoux is always talking about the people, at the same time as he's perfectly happy uh, to engage in, uh, in, uh, in luxury commissions, because as his, in his terms, luxury feeds, if it's directed in the right way, to, uh, to uh, to the, to the poor. So there's a continuous circle of beneficence that he's talking about. I think Sohn is interested in architecture. I think his idealism is entirely, uh, in, and this is, the, this is where Ledoux's first professionalism is exteriorized to the people, uh, whoever he's working with, and Sohn's professionalism is interiorized. Uh, and becomes uh, actually hermetically and claustrophobically sealed inside his own cell. I mean, I, I actually find Sohn a very disturbing character. Uh, I find uh, 
the do, uh, you know, a, a, a normal kind of, uh, of uh, cranky idealistic architect who, who thinks that everything he does is good. Uh, I think Sohm has this uh, absolute obsession with getting it right, uh, with uh, having the right history. You look at his thousands and thousands of notes, which I've never had the bravery to go through uh, for his academic lectures. You know, I mean, David Watkin waded through it and uh, gave us an enormously beneficent uh, chunk of, of his lectures, but, but they're boring, right? I mean, they're really boring. I mean, they are lectures that simply outline everything he's read. Uh, whereas I think Ledoux uh, is much more prone to uh, idealizing what he's read and activating any myth he wants, like Plato does, uh, for the good of uh, supporting the relationship between architecture and society. Mm. We'll have to return to the topic of Sohn the Man, uh, Paul, won't we? He was very complicated <laughs> and there is much to unpack. I'm going to condense a number of questions into a two-part question, Tony, and let you see us out with your response. Okay. I'll note, as I have in the past, that we're retaining the questions that we're not getting to, and we'll pose those to Tony and circulate his responses. There's some really excellent questions about details, and we want you to have answers to those questions. But this sort of overarching one asks, in the first part, what is the relationship between uh, Ledoux's idealism and some of the architectural currents of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, like the Beaux-Arts, like City Beautiful, or moving into modernism, the work of Corbusier or the Bauhaus. How do you see that? This is a big question, but I'll, we'll let you answer it however you like. How do you see um, Ledoux's idealism as impacting on later currents? And then a number of people have asked because you showed some examples of 20th century architecture and contemporary architecture, which currents do you find exciting today that might reflect some of the, the, the tensions, the ideas, the currents that you've explored in your talk? All right, the first one, um, you know, history in, in, in re retrospect, uh, uh, history is always written uh, in terms of the day it's written. It's never written uh, entirely neutrally, right? So every historian has their own questions uh, and those questions are answered in specific ways uh, in the past that they look at. Um, that was my point in the little book I wrote, uh, Histories of the Immediate Present. His mm -hmm. Historians always talk about uh, that which is important for their presence. So when, uh, when Emile Kaufman went to Paris, uh, he saw in uh, the work of Ledoux a kind of anticipation of the geometrization of architecture uh, that uh, had come to fruition in uh, his, uh, his, uh, his uh, Viennese uh, uh, hero, Neutre, and, uh, and uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, and so um, his, his history, which is quite good history, was always inflected by the sense that uh, he was looking at the beginning of, a, of, of something right, that had come to fruition in something else. Uh, that's, that's a sort of vision of history as a kind of, uh, uh, a kind of evolutionary uh, um, operation. Uh, I think that, um, that uh, and, and I think uh, around the 50s, the 1950s, uh, and I talked to uh, Johnson about this, uh, it was very inspiring uh, for uh, architects to, to find, and I mean, Aldo Rossi has the same relationship to the Enlightenment and to uh, Enlightenment typologies and uh, geometries uh, as all the others. Uh, it was very exciting for them to find ways of criticizing the rather dull international style uh, uh, exhibits that were, you know, the Bank of America life that they were, uh, that they were surrounded with, um, uh, but not yet giving up on the uh, abstraction uh, of, uh, of, of modernity, of modernism, right? So it was a way of, uh, of reabsorbing uh, the lessons of the Enlightenment, which had been severely criticized after the Holocaust and after the uh, Second World War, as uh, you know, the Enlightenment, progress, technology, 
uh, disaster and catastrophe, right? So how do we then get around this? Well, we get around this by uh, humanizing, as the, the postmoderns would say, humanizing architecture with references to its past, and at the same time, not quite giving up on the, uh, on the nature of, uh, of geometrical abstraction, right? So I think, yes, there, was, there were lots of, uh, of correlations there. And of course, I'm part of that generation and I know it only too well and always have to separate out, uh, but not totally, I can never do it totally, uh, my historical understanding from my, uh, from my taste. Mm. Uh, from the fact that I actually adore the work of uh, Ledoux and uh, Le Corbusier and, uh, and Sohn, uh, at the same time as I realized that uh, we can't uh, repeat uh, history and also have to repeat, uh, learn the lessons, and this is, comes to your second question, I think, learn the lessons of, uh, of, of, a, of an architecture that uh, was in the service of, uh, of powers that uh, it couldn't control, uh, that uh, was uh, only too ready uh, to monumentalize uh, social and political regimes, social and political institutions uh, that were deeply oppressive uh, and that uh, in its global effects uh, had uh, very strong um, neo-colonial uh, aspirations and effects. Um, so, when you read Ledoux today, when I read Ledoux today, I read him not as a, uh, as, as a, as a lesson uh, for today, but what I'm interested in is that aspect of Ledoux that is sensitive to the questions that we are facing now. And that's why I ended uh, with his uh, vision of an, of, of an earth uh, completely self-destroyed by its own catastrophes. Right, it's uh, climates, it's uh, volcanoes, and so on. This was an moment, uh, of course, in Ledoux's uh, life, of course, when uh, they were rediscovering Pompeii and Herculaneum, and had uh, had uh, really recognized uh, the shock uh, of uh, Vesuvius, the shock of the uh, great earthquake of Lisbon. Uh, these kinds of questions, which destabilized the rationalism of the Enlightenment and forced uh, architects like Ledoux uh, to begin to take measures in their architecture um, and in their thoughts uh, to understand that it wasn't just a battle, but also some form of compact uh, with nature. And so I read uh, Ledoux's text today uh, with picking out, if you like, uh, different uh, aspects and different uh, understandings uh, where we can begin to see uh, the emergence of, uh, of an understanding uh, of uh, environ, of environment, uh, which of course uh, resurged in my lifetime in the 70s with the, with the oil crisis and has, uh, was uh, neatly forgotten when the oil started to flow again and is now one of our most vital uh, questions. Uh, together, of course, with the social question, uh, which has been pointed in the last uh, uh, in the last uh, months and uh, and years uh, in the uh, devastation of populations in our cities. So, I think you know uh, today um, I can see an architecture emerging that is sensitive to these questions, uh, and uh, I would hope responsive to these questions. Uh, but at the same time, takes takes its distance from the uh, from the kind of idealism that is blind to such questions. Mm -hmm. Well, that is an inspiring note to end on. Yeah. And thank you, Tony, for this very timely intervention and engaging commentary. We are extremely grateful. Well, um, thank you, and uh, thank you for the opportunity of putting my thoughts together uh, in such a way, and I'd be very happy to answer any of the queries that, uh, that are sent in. We will pass them on to you, Tony, and then we'll pass them on to those who submitted questions that we haven't been able to get to. Now, before we log off, I'm afraid I must once again mention the Sohn Museum appeal, because for those who weren't able to join us at the beginning, 
Um, we want you to know that our appeal to support the Sohn Museum in London is ending, and we are, one, very grateful for those who've been able to contribute gifts, and two, very keen to ensure that those who haven't been able to give their support yet know where to find us, how to give, and that the appeal is ending soon. So your opportunity to help the museum see its way through to the end of the pandemic, fully funded, is, um, is happening right now. And you can access the Sohn Museum appeal at the link that is still in the chat on your screen. So please, please, please consider clicking through and giving a gift in any amount that's comfortable for you. Any amount at all helps. And Paul, I think you'd like to mention Michael. our upcoming event. Uh, Tony, it, it, I just want to go back for a second about, I mean, this is so fascinating. This, this could be a weekend very easily. You know, this could turn into this amazing discussion. I, I just want to say that uh, going back to the in, sort of inside outside that, and Sohn being a kind of the introvert of the two, that I do think that Sohn being in the in the, the century of romanticism, that he he was very interested in the mind and he was very introspective. And there's a poetic quality to his architecture that's very personal. And yeah. it's, um, it, 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 we could go on about this for a long time, it's a, it, but I just wanted to bring that up. It, yes. There's nothing that I think is quite different and that really had to do with the 19th century. And uh, it, it's true, it wasn't as expansive and it wasn't about, uh, kind of social manifestos, but it had to do with a sort of internal, um, uh, uh, looking at sort of internal feelings and emotions that came out of seeing these um, great historical places. As um, a child, when I entered the museum, I thought that uh, I would be, I was always completely lost and could never find my way out. <laughs> because even though it's so small, it's actually as big as the universe. That's what's so great about it. Um, so uh, we thank you all for joining us, and we invite you to join us again on Thursday, February 18th for a lecture by another great scholar, Barry Bergdahl. Uh, Barry will present Color Clashes in the Tropics, Oscar Niemeyer, uh, uh, Lina Bobardi, and Paulo Mendez de Rocha. Uh, February will be a perfect time for us to get out of New York and travel to Brazil. So we look forward to seeing you all there. And Tony, thank you so much. This is really a wonderful evening. Thank you. Good night.